Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this, our fourth day in our political tour of the US elections. Today, we're in Fauquier County, Virginia. It's not all that far from where we were yesterday in Fairfax. And as Malcolm Brown will be telling us shortly, it's substantially different, more rural, more conservative, and therefore more Republican. But before we go over to Malcolm, I just want to recap on what we've done so far in this series and where we're headed. So far, we've looked at three key parts of the electorate, blue collar X manufacturing Luzerne, Pennsylvania, urban Philadelphia, and then yesterday, suburban Fairfax County. And it seems fair to say, but what we've seen is reflected by the polls. Donald Trump has an uphill struggle ahead of him. Today is a crucial battleground area. It's described as ex-urban by the data analyst Dante Cini, not because of what it does for Trump in Virginia, which is essentially a blue state now, but what it does for him across the country. In short, he has to maintain his support here. We've got a great range of people for you to speak with, but before we do that, let's hear from Malcolm, live from Fakir County, Virginia. Malcolm. Well, we're right here on the street in the town of Warrington, about which uh, more in a moment. But uh, it's a beautiful autumn evening. We've been pretty lucky, generally speaking, on this tour. But uh, it's warm. Uh, they're closing off the street. This is a, a COVID era thing where basically bars and restaurants are allowed to take over the center of town and people are sitting outside and they're going to hear some music later on. And it's generally a very pleasant scene. Uh, but as you say, we're in Fauquier County and uh, this really is uh, a substantially different place, as you've intimated, and to get a, a more of a sense of this place, just earlier on, I went walk about and uh, caught up with a local. We're just a 40 minute drive from where we were yesterday, but politically it feels much further than that. We're in Fauquier County, Virginia. The most recent estimate from the US Census Bureau puts the population here at just over 71,000. Compare that to the one million plus in Fairfax. And while Fairfax is increasingly democratic, this is a reliably Republican area. President Trump won here in 2016 with almost 60% of the vote. Republican Mitt Romney got the same share of the vote four years before that in his failed attempt to eject Barack Obama from the White House. It's another pretty wealthy area full of horse pastures and vineyards. Where we are now is the center of the town of Warrington, the county seat. It began as a settlement back in the 18th century, and there's plenty of history here. These days, the main street that we're on tends to be a mix of restaurants and small boutique furniture and jewelry stores. To give us some local insights, we're going to talk with Coy Farrell, who was raised here and is now a journalist at the Fauquier Times, the local paper, with offices right here in town. Okay, Coy, thanks a lot for making time for us. Uh, where are we now? We are in front of uh, one of the courthouses in Warrington. This is a statue of John Marshall, the first Supreme Court Justice, who uh, grew up uh, just, just up the road here. Um, so we are in Old Town Warrington, the county seat of Fauquier County, um, and, and the biggest population center. What kind of place is this county? This is a this is a very conservative county in both senses of the term. Um, you know, most of these buildings have been here since you know 1800, which for, for the U.S. is, is a long time. And um, this is a county that, that uh, uh, likes things <laughs> a certain way. They, we, we, we take pride in our kind of quaint downtown atmosphere and in our farmland um, and just kind of our rural character. Even though we're close to DC, it's, it's a different universe almost. And, uh, and I think people are very conscious of keeping that kind of quaint um, environment in, uh, in a place that is, is increasingly closer to the big city, as it were. Right, and getting closer because I-66, the big road yes. um, near here, the highway is being expanded. It's yep. almost at this point like a, a runway yes. in some places. Um, so given that, I know that not being another suburb of Washington, you've yes. alluded to it, that's yes. a thing here, right? That is very much a thing here. So many people in this county do commute either to D.C. or places closer to D.C. Um, simply because that's where the you know economic center of, of this area is. Um, but I think people... Uh, live here because they want to escape that that kind of that kind of universe, that kind of world. Um, so even though we are pr pr approximate to and often work in uh, DC, um, I think people like coming home to something different that has a different character than uh, than maybe the hustle and bustle of big, the big city or the sprawling suburbs that every year get a little bit further out. Now. Uh, it's pretty reliably Republican here. How's the race been playing out? 
Yes, yeah, so um, I was actually just doing some, some data analysis today. Uh, it, remarkably, this county has grown about 10% um, per, per decade for the past couple of, of decades. And yet, uh, the share of the you know, Republican-Democratic divide has remained almost the same. Um, Hillary Clinton in 2016 got the exact same share of the, the, uh, the vote here in Fauquier County. She got about 30%, right? Uh, 35%, as did Al Gore in 2000. Um, so even with the growth, even with people moving here because of its proximity to D.C., it seems to be either people are being self-selecting and they move here because it's a conservative county or some other factor that we're just not aware of. But uh, it, it is very reliably about 60 percent of the county votes for the Republican candidate and 35 to 40 votes for the Democratic candidate with very few exceptions. How's the atmosphere? I was in uh, GOP Republican HQ the other day and a gentleman came in all sweaty and uh, upset and someone had taken his yard signs. I mean, right. so that seemed in a small way maybe indicative of some of the sort of the larger fighting and the, the, the political polarization that we're seeing. Do you detect that too? Oh, absolutely. People are, are on edge. Um, you know, uh, people on both sides of the political aisle have complained of having their roadside, uh, their signs stolen or, or vandalized. Um, you know, people have had their cars damaged because of, you know, presumably because of uh, the stickers they have they have on them. Um, it's people are very tense. People are very on edge, and uh, I think more and more we're seeing, uh, even in my, you know, my lifetime, and I grew up here, um, people fearful of putting signs out at all. People fearful of letting people know who they're going to vote for, um, because it's not just a political divide now. It's your your political um, side of the aisle defines who you are, and you know who might be nice to it's you. It's more of an not. identity thing. It is very right. much an identity thing. And it's, it's, you know, it's objectively sad because especially in a community like this where so many people know each other, I think people are, are, are very on edge. And uh, you know, it's pitting neighbors against neighbors and, and family members against family members uh, in a way that just didn't exist 20 years ago. Great. Thank you so much for making time. Absolutely. It's great, great to be here. Okay, so that's uh, one view of what's going on here, the sort of journalist's eye view, but uh, for an insider view uh, of the political process here, we're joined by uh, Greg Schumacher, uh, retired Major General in the US Army, who uh, now commands a different kind of army, and that's an army of volunteers who are trying to uh, win this county and uh, help uh, Republicans in the state. He's the GOP chair in Fauquier County. Uh, Greg, thanks a lot for joining us. Um, you, I, as I mentioned in that piece, I went to uh, take a look at your HQ and you, even though this is a reliably Republican county and seemingly very, you know, the, the numbers don't dip, as Coy was just saying, you don't seem to be taking anything for granted and you seem to be working very hard. Is that right? No, ab absolutely right. I, I have uh, always told our folks that uh, to get complacent is to, uh, is to uh, invite defeat. Uh, this is, uh, I, I tell folks all the time, we are con in a, almost in a continual war now in the arena of ideas, uh, and, uh, and it's not going to let up however this election comes out. So if we, uh, uh, you know, vo voter turnout is going to be the key, as it is in, in, in every election, but sometimes uh, when you have such a, as you said, a reliably Republican uh, county, uh, folks can get complacent about, eh, I'm a little tired today, a little busy, uh, don't need to get out to vote because, you know, we, we have such a, a great margin. Uh, and so I would uh, always tell everybody, do not take anything for granted whatsoever and get out there and support the candidates. Now, that said, uh, I'm just very excited uh, by, by all the excitement that I do see, the energy that I see. It's uh, uh, folks that have been in our committee in our county for a long, long time uh, have indicated uh, that they've never seen it quite like it is uh, these days. Where do you stand on the polls? I mean, pundits that we talk to and we ourselves look at the polls and, you know, say that this seems to be going for Joe Biden, although Democrats will also tell you that they're super scared that, that the polls are wrong again. But how do you see the numbers? I, I would uh, I would echo that. I mean, the polls are very, very similar uh, to what, the way they were back in 2016. Uh, everybody was just certain that uh, Hillary Clinton was going to win. And I think as Coy indicated earlier in your earlier clip, I mean, part of the reasons for that uh, are that uh, folks, uh, even even talking to pollsters, they don't tell them, uh, you know, who they're going to vote for or uh, or they lie to them. Uh, people maybe don't put the signs out. Uh, and the other thing is pollsters uh, typically are looking at, uh, you know, what they consider likely voters, people who uh, uh, 
uh, you know, who voted before. And one of the things we've seen with President Trump before, and we've heard it over and over with people coming into our headquarters, uh, that uh, folks are saying, hey, I've, I've not voted before. I mean, they're not in anybody's radar screen. I've not voted before, but this time I'm voting for Trump. We've had Democrats come in and say, hey, I've been a Democrat all my life, but my party is just going so far to the radical left, I, can, I just can't stand it anymore uh, and coming our way. So I, I really put, uh, quite honestly, very little faith in the polls uh, at this point, either way that it goes, because of the, uh, the, the numbers of people that are coming out, perhaps on the other side as well, uh, that uh, haven't voted before. Okay. So you talk about, you talk about, the, go, sorry, Nick. Go, uh, go on, Malcolm. Sorry, I was interrupting you. Go on. I was just going to ask, so, you know, you, you detect that the left is moving to the left and you're concerned about the radical left, but the, the Republicans here have also shifted arguably to the right, have they not? Because uh, in, the, in the House race here, the fifth district, so this goes beyond the borders of this particular county, but includes this county, and it's a huge district, a weirdly shaped, gerrymandered district that basically includes this part of Northern Virginia, but snakes all the way down to the North Carolina border. It's a vast, vast district. Um, but the, the local Republicans did unseat in the primaries the incumbent member of Congress, Denver Riggleman, because he had officiated at a gay same-sex wedding. Um, Republicans, local Republicans didn't like that, socially conservative here. So you've elected a Christian uh, conservative uh, to represent you in this election race. What was the thinking there? Were you behind that? So I guess I would just tell you this without getting too far down into the weeds, but I think it may be instructive for, uh, for your audience. Uh, and, and that is uh, here in Virginia, we still have uh, uh, local committees or at the state level, at, uh, at the district level, in the case you just alluded to in our fifth district race, uh, the committees decide uh, what form of uh, 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 election they want to take to select the nominee. And so you can either go with the primary uh, or you could go with a convention and uh, the, the leadership chose to go with a convention. So uh, just to bear in mind that and the way that works is delegates are signed up uh, really with you know, a couple of months before, uh, before the actual uh, uh, election process takes place. Uh, so what that means is you have a much smaller uh, subset uh, of the district that is signed up to do that. So, for example, you had maybe uh, Daniel Gade in the primary uh, received uh, in a three-way race uh, with about uh, 60,000 people voting, uh, took about 60% of the vote. Uh, in the convention race, uh, Bob Good was elected with uh, only 2,500 delegates uh, made that choice. So, uh, so you don't get quite as uh, representative a sample uh, of the district. And, and I know at some point, uh, uh, I, I sure want to defer to uh, my friend and, uh, and mentor, Paul Lawrence, who he's lived in this county all his life, and he may have some interesting perspectives, uh, very knowledgeable perspectives of, you know, where we sit, uh, you know, have we shifted, have we changed, and how we got to where we are. So uh, if I would, I would actually punt over to Paul right now, unless you have some questions for him specifically later. But Paul, I, I think some of the questions that have been asked, I think Paul, particularly in your area of expertise. Hey, Malcolm, it's uh, great to be here and uh, welcome to the Commonwealth of Virginia and the uh, cradle of democracy. So uh, uh, glad, to, glad to be a part of, uh, to be a part of the program. Um, I'm a 10th generation native of Virginia and uh, I'm also, as, uh, as Greg uh, is now, as a past chairman of the uh, committee uh, many years ago. So uh, when I was a very young guy at the age of, uh, we age of 25. So um, had a lot of uh, experience throughout the, uh, throughout the years with the political process. And yes, this is going to be a very interesting election. And if I could uh, put my finger in the air and, and, um, and give you a, a, a true idea of where we were going to be come election night, I'd, uh, I'd make a lot of money. But uh, um, it is, uh, it's very, very interesting to see how we're going to end up. So um, I think uh, there are a lot of people who just are either unwilling or uh, afraid or flat out just do not want to be involved in any of the processes that are going to show up to vote as they did in 2016, I'm, I'm, as Greg has is, is, uh, also explained, as Coy was saying earlier, I think there's a lot of people out there that are just very, um, uh, they're very motivated uh, this time to come out to vote. And I don't think necessarily that the polls are reflective of um, that sentiment. Um, much like in 2016, where there was a lot of surprises, a lot of people 
uh, either answered incorrectly in the polling uh, on purpose um, or there, the polling was just flat out flawed. Um, I think right now there are uh, many people that, uh, that are uh, basically, you know, not really saying where they are and, but they are going to come out and vote for Donald Trump. Um, so I, I would personally be surprised based on the, the activity and the enthusiasm um, that, that I've personally witnessed if, uh, if uh, Donald Trump does not win this, but um, it, uh, it, the, other, the other base that was largely asleep, the Democratic base that was largely asleep, I think because they were lulled into complacency believing that Hillary was a shoe-in, um, Hillary Clinton was a shoe-in, I think they are also motivated to come out and vote this time, which is why I'm saying I think it's very difficult to get a, a bellwether as to whether or not it's going to go one way or the other. I think, um, I think it, uh, uh, as a true pundit, I would say it's either going to be really close or a blowout. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you very much um, to all of you. Thank you very much indeed for Malcolm for that introduction and also to you, um, Gregory and Paul, for your, for your initial comments there. I want to encourage everyone listening into um, this call um, to put their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, just for, for um, uh, Paul, I know Annette McCulloch has just joined the, uh, joined the call here and um, Paul as well. I'm Nicholas, I'm based in the UK uh, and I'm hosting this series here um, and very much looking forward to putting some more questions to you. But please, if everyone can put questions in the Q&A box, you can bring, you can start, we can open up this questioning session very, very quickly. Um, in a moment, I want to come to you, Keith and Annette, because you've got an interesting story to tell. But I want to just come, come back to you, Gregory, on that split in the Republican Party. Just to recap on what Malcolm was saying, um, Riddleman, who the, was the in, incumbent congressman, Republican con congressman in the 5th District, was effectively deselected after he had, um, or basically was seen to be too liberal or um, perhaps too libertarian. Where did you stand in that in that debate, Gregory? Who did you support? Uh, I personally supported uh, Denver Riggleman, and I guess uh, uh, you know, truth truth be told, I mean, I, I'm I'm a good friend of Denver's. I got to know him very well. Uh, he he is uh, he is a Republican with uh, libertarian leanings. Uh, he uh, he always talks about supporting. Uh, you know, he, he will make a decision based on uh, what he calls the three C's which is the constitution, his constituents, uh, and his conscience. Uh, but as, as the campaign went on, and again, as I said, it was a you know, smaller subset of the district that actually you know, made, made the choice. But what we heard often during the campaign is that he was not conservative enough for this uh, uh, very conservative district. Uh, what, what does that mean? Um, because he had a very, his, his voting record, record was, I think was, 95% in favor of Trump's, um, in favor of the party's um, uh, legislation. Uh, he was endorsed by Trump. So what was he doing wrong? Uh, you know, very, very honestly, I, I think when you, uh, when, you, when you get into, you know, politics and uh, I mean, even we talked about the passions between the two parties um, uh, and, and now you talk about the passions within the party. And I think for, uh, just for some, uh, they just considered that he, he was not, uh, uh, conservative enough, uh, and uh, I, I found him, uh, and he still is our serving congressman, to be extremely effective as a congressman uh, for our, our district uh, and others. But uh, but the point at this point, uh, we we did have a nomination method. Uh, we 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 have selected our nominee, who who is Bob Good, and uh, and certainly if we look, uh, what I tell people all the time, you know, we hear people. Uh, people will come in the office and they'll tell me, they'll say, Greg, look, I, I'm a lifelong Republican, but eh, Trump, you know, his tweets and, you know, he's not presidential. Uh, and I say, look, it's not, ultimately, it's not about Trump or Biden. Uh, it's about two very different directions for the future of our country. And it's whether we preserve the America of the founding and the, the ideals found in, in the Declaration and the Constitution, uh, or if we move down a path towards socialism. And so in the current race, looking between the Cameron Webb and Bob Good, uh, they likewise represent, uh, uh, you know, those two very different directions uh, for, for the future of our country. Uh, so Greg, so is that something not, you're saying on the doorsteps, then it's not about Trump, it's about not having the Democrats in the White House? 
Uh, well, it's about not having the Democrats uh, in power. I mean, I mean, it is about Trump. I personally feel that uh, that uh, we, we've been very blessed to have a President Trump, a businessman, uh, a disruptor who is not you know, doesn't come from the political class. And, and I would guess uh, in, in uh, your country and others, and I think we've got listeners from Australia and other places, uh, I mean, uh, politicians can get very isolated from, uh, from the, you know, the people. Uh, and Trump is very much more in tune with that. He's a businessman. He, do, he hasn't grown up through the political ranks. He's, uh, he's direct. He's, he says what he thinks. Uh, so, so of course, there, the, the the man, the person, uh, you know, w w man, woman, whoever, whoever's in the office, it does make a difference. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the greater difference is what what uh, uh, you know, which party is going to be in charge of plotting the direction uh, uh, where we go. So, for example, we would we would see that. I mean, prior to COVID, I mean, our economy was going gangbusters. We had the lowest unemployment for, for Blacks, for Hispanics, for women, uh, really for the entire country. Uh, we were bringing manufacturing jobs back to the U.S. We cut regulations. We, we cut taxes. Uh, and basically, Joe Biden has says if he wins, he's going to basically undo every one of those things, uh, which, uh, you know, I and certainly our party predicts will just take us right down the path back to where we were, losing manufacturing jobs, increasing unemployment, and, and certainly losing personal liberty and freedom uh, as we go towards a path of socialism and more government control. Okay, Gregory, thank you very much for that. I'm going to turn now to Annette uh, and Keith. Um, Annette, you are uh, an assistant school teacher in a, is it a, a primary school in, in the neighborhood? It's a university model school, a Christian private school um, that actually has a Christian and a um, homeschooling uh, bend to it. Okay, okay. And uh, are you on, uh, you, you're a member of the party, is that right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, Keith, you are a pastor, you're a minister, is that right? That's correct. And I am bivocational. I'm also a, uh, a project manager. Okay, okay. And but you are not affiliated to any particular party, but you would, just to take that fifth congressional race, which candidate did you support in that? Uh, I originally backed uh, Denver Riggleman uh, just because I, I didn't, why I did not agree with that one uh, activity. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, and so. I pick you up on that. That's his, when he officiated at a same sex marriage. Is that right? That's correct. And so while I did not agree with that, I mean, it's that one thing did not overwrite everything else that I feel that he did. Okay, okay. And so that would be the key. So that's something that you would oppose. You, you oppose same-sex marriage. Uh, I am opposed to same-sex marriage. Yeah, okay, great. Can, can you tell us more about um, why you support Donald Trump? What's your, why, why do you believe he is the candidate that, that, for, for you? And also but basically for religious reasons, I guess. Well, uh, in, in a manner, yes. Um, I mean, I look at a candidate not necessarily about party. I mean, I, I look at the first three chapters of the Bible and I see which candidate lines up the most with the, the principles that I find in the first three chapters you know, of the Bible. I mean, we talk about, do they believe in God? And if they don't, I mean, I'm not opposed to voting for an atheist, but does that individual allow me the freedom to practice the religion you know, that I've chosen? You know how do they view life? And I'm not necessarily just talking about abortion because, you know, conservatives are always thrown under the bus, but, oh, you're a one issue voter. Uh, but I mean, how do you treat life in general and not just in the womb, but how do you treat life, you know, throughout life from, from the womb to the tomb? So there are a lot of different things that I look at when I look at a candidate uh, that has little to do with party they're in, but more to do with how they align with my biblical understanding. And, and looking back over the past four years, how has Donald Trump done that for you? Uh, he's done well, not perfect, obviously, but uh, there's been only one perfect man to walk the earth. So uh, I don't expect him to duplicate that. Uh, but I, I do expect him to, one, do what he says he's going to do. And I think for the most part, it, he's done that. Uh, he has been the most pro-life uh, president that we've had in quite some time. If we just want to talk about the abortion issue, 
I mean, I think it's plain for everyone to see that we're, we're darker hued than everyone else on uh, this particular call here. He's done a lot for people who look like us, you know, since he's been in office. So it, it can't really complain about that. Uh, so a, a lot that he's many done. People on this call would find that one hard to believe. I mean, because, um, you know, if you compare Biden and him, I mean, Trump has been far more, has been overtly racist. Um, you know, throughout much of his life, and how, also, how has he been overtly racist? Well, I mean, we could talk about his um, the referral to the the Mexican judge. He wasn't a judge; he was just from Indiana, and uh, he was implied that because he was of Mexican heritage, he would be against him in terms of a decision. I mean, when there are there are numerous examples. Oh, yeah, I don't recall that one there. Uh, I, that one I would definitely have to look at. But a lot of the things that I've heard thrown his way as far as him being racist have really been the media taking his words either out of context uh, or just flat out lying about the things that he's said. Right. Uh, for, for example, Charlottesville, that's the one that gets thrown up a lot. You know, you know he, he said there were good people on both sides, right? And, and they cut the video off right there. But right after that, he specifically says, I'm not talking about the white supremacists down there. And he disavowed them even in that particular speech there. They don't show that part. They just stop it at him saying, there are good people on both sides. I, I think the other term that's often been thrown his way is dog whistles. Malcolm, do you want to take this from, from here? I mean, yeah, uh, so on the, the race issue, uh, I, I gather that you get a certain amount of grief online for your political positions from fellow members of the African-American community. Is, is that right? I mean, my wife and my son definitely do, uh, just because they're a lot more vocal online. Uh, I choose not to wade in that, in that arena, uh, just because that, that's just not me. That's not who I am. I'm not gonna sit up on social media and argue with people, you know, back and forth. Uh, if they wanna, look at things a certain way. I mean, that's their privilege here in America. You're, you're free to do that. Uh, but on, on the flip side of that, I'm free to look at things the way that I want to also. And, and just because we don't agree doesn't mean that I have to subject myself to name calling and things like that. Great. Okay. On, so, sorry. Uh, I mean, on. So for, uh, as a friend, when you see Donald Trump says, he, as he said in the debate this week, I'm the least person, racist person in the room. I've been the best president for African-Americans since Abraham Lincoln. Do you take him literally or do you just think that's his sort of manner of speech? Uh, uh, Donald Trump's a New Yorker and that's kind of the way that they talk. I mean, there's a certain bravado in the way that they talk, you know, being from New York. I mean, he's obviously very uh, proud of himself. Uh, he, he thinks of himself, you know, pretty highly, uh, which, you know, can be a character flaw, but quite honestly, anyone who gets to that position, you know, as president, chances are they're, they're somewhat arrogant anyway, that they believe, uh, that they're better than everybody else in the room. So I don't fault him for that. I, I think pretty much every president before him is the same way. Um, so do I take him literally? Uh, no, but when you look at policy, you compare his policies to policies of presidents in, in the past. I mean, it's kind of hard to to argue against that statement. I mean, I, I'd definitely be willing to listen to what other people might want to say, or I mean, they may try to throw out the civil you know rights movement there, but you know we could talk about that one uh, when there was a, a higher percentage of Republicans that voted for the Civil Rights Act than there were you know Democrats. So, and I believe the president was just pretty much he had to sign it at that point. Malcolm, I would I would say that. Uh... That is the one issue that, that many of us Republicans have with Donald Trump um, is that um, he tends to speak in hyperbole, uh, tends to stretch things out. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to kind of back away from that because uh, as, as Keith was just suggesting, his, his background is, is really, uh, uh, for those people who understand New York and know, know it's, a, it's a fighter mentality there, um, it's a very much a streetwise mentality that uh, that is there, particularly having somebody who's done the construction that he's done. Um, it kind of explains where he's come from, but but it is the one thing that really I think upsets a lot of our people 
that he uh, he speaks uh, he just he says things many times without really taking a step back and saying how is this going to be uh, decoded uh, in, in the community and and um, and it's caused him a lot of issues and uh, quite frankly it's uh, it's been it's been something I've had to have many discussions with many uh, many people over about um, you know do we look past that and uh, and really look as Keith said at policy what has he actually done. And the actual policy and what he's actually done uh, is has really been very good, and uh, and I think that that's really at the end of the day where where most people are right now. They're trying to figure out is it really the character of the man and the way we see it versus what uh, he's actually actually achieved and done and put forth as policy. It's absolutely fascinating and <clears throat> very rewarding in a way to hear these opinions. Um, from our perspective, you're, we've got people listening in here from the UK, some in the States, people in New Zealand and Australia. And I think it's fair to say, you know, our overall opinion of Donald Trump and the US administration is a very, very negative one. And I would say also that it, we're fairly astounded that there's so much residual support for Donald Trump. So it's very, very informative to hear all these views and to get this interpretation here and now. Thank you very much for all of this. Um, I want to bring in some questions now and uh, from the audience who are listening in. We've got Nigel Harley, who's got a question which is very, I think, re quite relevant to this section of the conversation. Uh, and then Lynn Maddock. Um, so if we could bring up Nigel Harley now and then um, Lynn Maddock, that would, that would be great. Um, and then we'll follow that up with um, a question from Caroline Sumnall. So that's in a different order to the questions that have been put in the, the, in the uh, on the Q and A sheet, just to, just to my right here. So let's let's bring in uh, Nigel. Go ahead, Nigel. Yes, I was just uh, interested to know what the reaction is um, over the the choice of Kamala Harris uh, on the vice presidential ticket, because I think on this occasion, given the age of the Democratic candidate, that uh, this really does focus a lot more than normally on the vice president. And I'm wondering, in a sort of typically conservative place that we're talking about. Um, just what the reaction is. Thank you. Who, who wants to take that one first? Um, the appointment of Kamala Harris. I'll take a quick stab at it. So, so uh, it, as you might recall, she was actually the first of I don't know how many how many candidates did they have for president on the Democrat side? Uh, you know, 16, 23, I don't know what the number was. She was, as I recall, the first to drop out because she couldn't get any traction. Uh, part of that, I think, is because uh, I think, truthfully, she's really not that uh, likable, uh, number one. Number two, I, I, she's considered to be like the most liberal uh, Democrat in the Senate. So when you have a person uh, with that kind of a background, well, then about Bernie? I think even more so than Bernie, quite honestly. Uh, and, and so when you have somebody with that kind of, uh, uh, you know, background, uh, first to drop out of the race that now is the vice pres presidential nominee, and, and let's face it, uh, uh, Joe Biden is 78 years old. Uh, uh, he, he handled himself fairly well, and I think in the two debates, but in many, many of the other clips where you see him, uh, he, he, he's continually forgetting things. And I'm not like, look, I'm, I'm getting older myself, uh, but he's got, he's got 10 years on me. But uh, but I'm just saying, when you're talking about the president of the United States, uh, we've just seen him with, with many, many lapses of, uh, you know, just some of those early things that happened to all of us, I think, as we, we get more aged. So uh, I know I, very few people, I think, if he were to win, uh, think that he would, uh, you know, even make it for, through a full first term without perhaps resigning for, you know, medical reasons or whatever the case might be. So I find it very interesting uh, that, that she was chosen. Greg, isn't that all the more staggering that people are voting for um, Biden? Apparently, the opinion polls show them people switching over to Biden and, and having such a large lead when he is 77, when he apparently seems to be, uh, it seems to be an anyone but Trump candidate. Yeah, well, and, and I think that uh, we, we, you know, we've kind of talked around this a lot of times about, you know, about the voting and the polls and what we believe about the polls and so on. But I think uh, really for uh, uh, for. I think most of the vote, um, uh, 
you know, against Trump is, is primarily that, is people that just don't like Trump. I think, you know, Democrats were, uh, you know, mad as heck that they, they lost the last time in 2016. Uh, they've hated Trump. They've uh, ushered in a resistance, if you will. Uh, I find it fascinating. They, they talk about, you know, will Trump, you know, relinquish power? I mean, as soon as he said nothing but full-blown resistance from, from the media, from, you know, from people, from the Democrats. I mean, there was no acceptance at all. Uh, you, you know, from uh, for him being elected as the president. So, so I think much of the uh, the vote is people that have a negative uh, reaction against Trump. It's anti-Trump, uh, and and even not even realizing themselves, even on the Democrat side, uh, the extent of the uh, uh, radical socialist direction that their party is actually taking. Okay, Lynn Maddock, and then Caroline Sumner. Go ahead, Lynn. Uh, thanks, Nicholas. Look, I'm interested in the Republican strategy in the Senate for oppose, opposing broad relief for um, COVID, for the economy, for COVID effects, rather than narrow relief. Um, and even though that may well help Trump to get broad relief out there, do people think that the um, Senate Republicans have given up on Trump and want to deny Biden the war chest? Or are they standing on the principle of small government, even though it might help Trump not to? So okay. let, me, yeah, let me jump in and say, first of all, in, in the United States, the actually the House of Representatives is the body that spends money. The Senate um, is simply has to um, uh, acquiesce to that or not. And so uh, the, the money bills actually come out of the House of Representatives. And right now, Nancy Pelosi is what's really holding a deal back because she does not want to give, uh, she doesn't want to give a, a stimulus bill or, 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 or a win to, to Donald Trump. She really wants to wait until after the election um, to be able to go out and do that. So I think that partially answers your question, but I want to make sure we were clear on, on where the money bills come from. But Paul, haven't, haven't the, the, the House has passed legislation, but it was just, I mean, too big for Republicans to, to stomach. Isn't that right? It was a $2 trillion package. I mean, that's out there and they could take that up and sort of work on it, right? Correct. And, and one of the big issues is we have a lot of, of democratically controlled cities in the United States that are a disaster. They have way, way overspent for many, many years. They've, they've, they've written checks that they couldn't cash. And now they're trying to use the COVID relief funding to basically bail out years and years and years of bad decisions. And so it's, this is not a COVID funding issue for many, many of the Republicans on the Senate side. It is a check on this just complete uh, uh, spending free that they want to have. And so uh, there, there are many on the conservative Republican side are saying, if we're going to pass a bill, let's pass a clean bill that is really designed to go out and help uh, everyday Americans on the street who are suffering from COVID and not spend billions of dollars to bail out uh, local governments that uh, will n do nothing but take this money and it won't, won't go to the street. It will go to paying off contractors and things that they have done for years, bad, bad business. So um, pension funds and everything else. Absolutely. So yeah, thank you for that. So that's really, that's really the crux of, uh, it's not a, it's not a fight over whether or not to help the person on the street. It's, it's whether or not uh, the money is going to actually get to the person on the street. Uh, Caroline Sumner. Um, firstly, thank you all so much because we're all fascinated by your views and really appreciate you sharing. So thank you. Um, I am interested what you think Trump's greatest accomplishment is so far. Go, oh, Keith and Annette. Go on. What do you think Trump's greatest accomplishment is so far? I would like to say um, that he's made promises about things and he's kept them as long as um, the Democrats or the left. Um, or the liberals haven't stood in his way, spun the media in such a way that um, this illusions people against what he's really trying to do as far as helping our country. For example, um, I believe that as um, an African-American 
black person and a woman, I feel that he has really tried to work toward helping all of us. It has manifested itself and specifically he can say, I've done this for the black community or the Hispanic community, but he's done all of those things in a way that helps everyone else as well. In other situations, we find there are policies that are put out that may help, for example, um, illegal aliens at the plight of everyone else. And so those are the things I'm mostly impressed with for him, that he is honest and many times to a fault. He says what he believes and what he thinks, and he doesn't back down from that. And so I, I love his honesty and his ability to help everyone, even though there are specific people that are being, the light has been shown on. For, um, forgive me for putting you in this position, but you, uh -huh. you, you are two African-Americans, you Republicans, and that makes you unusual, at least in, in our eyes. And it puts you against the, um, the call, the, the huge fur that we've seen this, uh, this summer with the Black Lives Matter movement. What do you make of that? Uh, so, uh, the, I don't think anyone in their right mind would disagree with the sentiment that Black Lives Matter, right? I mean, the Black people, as well as every other demographic group are image bearers of God. And so to, to, to have the notion that Black people are somehow, their lives don't matter, would just be a foolish notion. Uh, but as far as the organization, uh, from a biblical standpoint, there's no way I could support that organization. They, they stand for things that are totally against the Bible, the disruption of the nuclear family, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the mainly surrounding themselves about, uh, around women. Not that I have an issue with, with women. I'm married to he one. Doesn't. Right. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, but also with the, the, the issue of, you know, the trans rights and, 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 and gay rights as a whole. I mean, from a biblical standpoint, the organization is just far away uh, from the word of God. Now, while I do not agree with the homosexual lifestyle, I also do not agree that they should be discriminated against, uh, that they should be harmed in any way because of how they choose to live their life, that they, they should be able to get housing and employment and, and all those other things. Uh, that everyone, because they're still, in my view, they're still image bearers of God, even though they're choosing the, the lifestyle that they're choosing. Uh, but there's no way that I could uh, stand, you know, with, uh, and I don't even go to events that have BLM on it, because you cannot separate the, the sediment from the organization. And how, how have you felt when you've seen Donald Trump deploy federal forces to places like Portland, Oregon, or uh, the deployment of forces around the White House in Washington, D.C. Were those, um, particularly that one, where he stood outside the church with, with the Bible, having dispersed um, a, a crowd that was, was not violent at that time. Right. What, what were your sentiments at that time? Well, the, the, the thing in front of this, uh, the church, in my opinion, wasn't one of his you know, crowning moments, for sure. Uh, I, I, I don't think that was something that he should have done. Uh, but it, as far as I know, federal forces are already in, you know, every state and they're there to protect, you know, federal buildings. So I, I'm not exactly sure if he's calling up anything new in those particular cases, or he's just an act of, hey, protect these federal buildings. Uh, and out, uh, any interaction that the, the people had, again, as far as I know, you may have different information. It wasn't necessarily with federal forces, it was with the local law enforcement. Okay. So, and thank you and may I add my, my personal opinion on it is that I wish that he had done those things sooner because so many people, Black people, lost their lives, their livelihoods because of all of the violence and all of the destruction that has been um, fostered through Black Lives Matter organizations like Antifa and the like. Mm, okay. If, if I could jump in and uh, maybe add to uh, Caroline's question about, uh, I've been thinking about this because uh, I believe Trump has many, many accomplishments, uh, very positive ones, but uh, 
and maybe in a broad way to try and think what I would consider his most. When he ran even the last time, uh, though he ran as a Republican, I really said it was uh, Donald Trump versus the establishment uh, of both parties. And, uh, and I think what we've certainly seen in our country, and I, my guess is uh, you hope, those of you from you know, what you said, UK, New Zealand, Australia, uh, probably see it in yours, you know, over time, uh, we get to this, uh, you know, this elitist professional class. Uh, and look, I'm a retired major general. So I mean, I guess I've been part of that, uh, you know, the government bureaucracy and the military and whatnot. Uh, but, uh, but that essentially over time, get to believe that they're, they're smarter than everybody else, you know, hey, let us professionals run the government and all you rubes out in the, you know, the citizens, uh, uh, we don't really, we don't really care ultimately what you think. Uh, so I think Donald Trump, the most significant thing he did was to be a was a disruptive factor uh, in the middle of, of, of the way Washington typically works. Uh, some of the things that he has accomplished is because he has not just gone along with all of the normal bureaucratic processes, uh, the way we have always done it. Hey, 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 uh, Mr. President, this is the way it's done. You say, yeah, well, the way it's done means it doesn't get done. But Greg, uh, surely you've had the most chaotic period in American government in, in, you know, for many decades, and that's the result of his disruption. Well, you know, I, I guess what I would say to that, uh, uh, Nicholas, is it's chaotic because of the uh, just the, kind of the blind hatred of the resistance from from the Democrat side, and they made it chaotic. I mean, they. Uh, uh, if, if you were appointed as one of his um, general advisors, you'd probably be in the job for about three months, and then you'd be out again. Uh, perhaps, perhaps, but I think uh, that's also the way, I mean, again, we, we've got a businessman that's there. We have, uh, look, I mean, I've been around government, like I said, for 37 years um, before I retired, and uh, and there, there are so many, look, we've got many wonderful, wonderful, very competent, you know, uh, very intelligent people that work in government. By the same token, uh, we have many people that work in government that have unprecedented protections uh, from incompetence. Uh, that, that you do not find out in the private sector. So uh, Trump coming from a business perspective, I mean, uh, you know, in businesses, it's like, hey, you're, if you're not doing the job or I'm not doing the job I think you need to be doing, you're, you're, you're done. And uh, so maybe chaotic in the sense that uh, maybe there wasn't so long-term continuity, but in terms of the actual results, uh, and I think uh, Paul and uh, Keith and Annette have talked about it, uh, you know, I have and, and others will, uh, the results I think have spoken for, for themselves. Yuri Wint, you've got a question, Yuri. Go ahead, Yuri. Yuri's in Australia. Go on, Yuri. Ah. Oh. It's Louise. Hello, Louise. <laughs> so uh, just a question about um, um, what, what happened in your area in the 2018 midterms? Was there a shift in the percentage vote? Was there any change in the Democrat-Republican split in 2018? Thanks. In our particular, uh, in our particular county, uh, it, it, stayed, it stayed about the same. Uh, we... Uh, you know, so I get that, that kind of speaks, I guess, to the demographics uh, of the area. I don't, oh, and, yeah. and what about Virginia, Greg? What was the, what happened in the, just to get an idea statewide, what's happened between uh, 2016, 2018, and you've got which, which congressional districts are in play this time around as well? Well, so, uh, you know, really the fifth should not be in play, uh, but again, if, you know, I've, I've several of us told you we, we think about the polls and what we believe in them, but if we believe the polls, uh, you know, pundits that look at it uh, now consider the fifth to be a toss up when it should have been very reliably, you know, a Republican district. Uh, I think the, the uh, seventh, uh, 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 the seventh and the tenth, I think, are, are certainly in play. And what you have to see, I think in the midterms, there was, uh, yeah, I think there was a, uh, you know, a large anti Trump, you know, reaction that I think saw itself play out in the middle. I think. Uh, uh, and let me kind of go back to uh, kind of goes back to maybe your earlier question about um, uh, you know Riggleman being unseated by by Good and, and that kind of th thing. You know we uh, and I want to maybe address one of the things that Keith said. Uh, look, Republicans haven't won a statewide election in Virginia since I think 2004, and I think what happens is. Uh, you know, politics is downstream from culture, uh, you know, and the culture is at a certain place. You cannot turn the culture back with, you know, with a simple, hey, we're going to like this person to go affect that change. Uh, the culture, uh, 
you know, the political winds will change when, when the people that vote within the culture change. And that's through, uh, you know, winning hearts and minds in the arena of ideas. Uh, so, so I think, um, I think where, where more people are is, uh, is, is maybe trying to avoid what they might consider to be the extremes. And, and I think the notion is, I wanna highlight something that Keith said about LGBTQ issues and whatnot. Uh, the, the, I think the issue is not so much a matter of rights, but what, what I think has happened, at least as I perceive in this country, uh, and, I, and I can't speak to, to, to yours of those listening, but uh, you know, Keith talked very eloquently and I, I certainly echo it, his call for you know, religious freedom. Our first amendment, we have freedom of religion, but what has happened in recent years uh, it appears is that uh, kind of like Animal Farm, all rights are equal, but some rights are more equal than others. Uh, and so what we find is if in so-called equal rights, uh, sometimes if, uh, if LGBTQ rights come in conflict with religious rights, uh, then courts are interpreting, uh, you know, they are, they are selecting one right over another right, uh, rather than just allowing people to, you know, uh, you know, kind of live and let live. And I think that's led to a lot of the polarization that we have as well, this whole, uh, you know, just one prescribed narrative and that's the only one that's acceptable. Uh, and then, you know, conversations are shut down. Um, uh, people, I mean, they're shouted down, they can't even speak. Heck, we've got even, uh, you know, even with the, not to open another whole can of worms, but with the Biden laptop and, you know, uh, 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 Hunter Biden's business dealings with Ukraine and China and, you know, billions of dollars for, for with no expertise, et cetera, uh, clear influence uh, peddling and pay for play. Uh, but it's like we now have even uh, Facebook and Twitter not even allowing, uh, not even allowing this to even be discussed. I mean, it, it's censorship to a, an appalling degree uh, in a country that is supposed to allow free speech. Um, we've got so many questions here. I'm going to have to take them in pairs. So I'm going to take Sheila de Belaig, uh, and then I can see Geraldine Gills. I just see your names next to each other. So if I can take Sheila, if you can say your question, and then Geraldine Gills straight off the back of it. Go ahead, Sheila. Okay. I think I've really been answered by the conviction with which um, you have, the various people have spoken. But I wanted to ask Gregory and Keith and Annette and Paul whether they felt that President Trump uh, really does represent traditional Republican ideals. On has he changed the party? Okay, and then Geraldine Gill. And uh, on the heels of that, uh, we are talking, or you've mentioned that the Democrats appear to be socialistic. Have you not detected a little touch of authoritarianism with our President Trump? Mm -mm. Well, let me jump in to try to do it quickly and give Paul and, and Keith and Annette. So, so to, to the authoritarian thing, for, I mean, I hear that all the time. People are saying he's authoritarian. <laughs> and and I, I, for the life of me, I, I try and I, I try and figure what, what has he done that is authoritarian? Uh, uh, you know, certainly, I mean, he passed a lot of executive orders, which were simply countermanding the executive orders of his predecessor. Uh, so truthfully, I, uh, and if you've got some examples, I'd be happy to try and uh, comment on that. And in terms of ideals, I think uh, I would say, uh, you know, he has changed the party. I would say I'll let Paul, who's got a much broader perspective on that than I do, but I would say this, I would say, you know, you've, you've probably all heard of, you know, the, the, like the never Trumpers, right? Uh, and there are some, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, like Bill Crystal would be one that comes to mind who would consider himself to be a very, uh, you know, ideological uh, conservative. Uh, and I think the reason why many of those people hate Trump is because the truth is he is not an ideological conservative. Uh, he, he's, he's, a, he's a man that deeply loves this country and he's very pragmatic. Uh, I find that he does very, uh, things that are really he's achieved, you know, more things for conservative principles than uh, perhaps even than Ronald Reagan did. Uh, but he does it not because he's a conservative uh, ideologue, but because he, he's a pragmatic uh, uh, person who wants to get things done. And, uh, and certainly we who are conservative believe that the conservative principles, you know, are the right principles that, uh, uh, that will, that will you know, accrue the greatest benefits for the largest number of people. Mm. Just following up on those two questions, it would seem that if you look in the flow of Republican leaders, if you go from George Bush Sr. 
to George W. Bush, and then you look at candidates like um, McCain, and then you've got Mitt Romney. Um, you know, the, as as a as a conservative, as a Republican, Trump really doesn't seem to fit that mold. And, and, and thank God. Yes. <laughs> hallelujah. Okay, hallelujah. So that that means that the the Republican Party, in your view in your minds, and maybe Annette and Keith can answer this, has changed for good. Uh, I'm not sure if, um, if we can say it's changed for good, but the temporary change that it has had is a welcome one from my perspective. Um, the gentleman that you named um, as presidents or candidates for presidency for the Republican side, they have been politicians and they have, um, as I mature and I research, find that they were doing deals in areas um, that they weren't made apparent. Um, and so the secretiveness of those dealings have, have made a lot of sense as to why we can't move certain areas forward in the conservative Republican party. Um, oh. Because many times those same individuals are operating within what some would call the swamp. They are operating within and they're um, scratching each other's backs. There are Republicans who are Republican in name only. Their policies, their voting record does not support what they have said to their constituents. Okay. Great. Um, let, let's bring in some more questions. Um, I'll take Claudia Baker uh, and Piers. Let's to go with Piers Reynolds to start with. So Piers Reynolds first and then Claudia Baker. Go ahead, Piers. You just need to unplug your mic on bottom left hand side. Piers. Yeah, yeah. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. Slightly yeah. different question than the one I intended. What has okay. been the reaction among your supporters to the revelations about Trump's taxes and foreign debts? Uh, Paul, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, look, you're, you're talking about a, a person who was for many years had no intention of being in politics, uh, didn't didn't prepare for um, kind of the scrutiny that would occur, um, you know. Uh, Does the, that justify it, Paul? <laughs> I've got to ask that. Wait, you're, you're making the assumption that something is, is wrong. Um, I mean, just because he, he had a Chinese bank account um, where he was going to open a hotel in China and then turned around and decided not to do it. And that occurred prior to even uh, him running for office. And now they bring it up and say, oh, well, he had a Chinese bank account. Uh, well, of course he had a Chinese bank account. You're going to open up a hotel in China. You're going to need to, you know, it's like if you move to, uh, you know, Lincolnshire, you can go open up a hotel there. You're going to open up a, a, a bank account. I mean, so that doesn't, I think that, doesn't really do a whole lot on the street. Um, I think most people are kind of like, okay, so. Um, Don't you think that if this was all right, he should just release his tax returns, which he's allowed to do? So the tax return issue, yeah, the tax return issue is is a is a sticky widget for for him. Um, I'm sure that he has um, that the the probably the overall uh, strategy is look, I you know don't don't release these taxes. Um, there's probably nothing really wrong there. The problem with it is, is when he releases them, it will just open up an onslaught of just scrutiny of this and that. Where did you spend your money on this? What did you donate to? What did, where did you take a write off? And it's just, it, it just totally changes the focus of, of where he, you know, his messaging. So I don't blame him. I mean, it really, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, Quite frankly, you all have seen it already. I mean, his tax return has been leaked. Um, uh, if, if he was really had done something wrong, believe me, it would have been leaked. Um, it would have been, it, somebody would have made a lot of money uh, getting paid off to release uh, whatever it is he would have done wrong. So I don't necessarily see that as being uh, a negative for him. I really understand. And I think most people probably understand why he's not doing it, um, but- uh, oh. Thank you for that there. I think Malcolm's got some additional guests for us uh, in, in downtown. Um, Malcolm, if you, uh, I don't know if you managed to convince your, um, your friends there to say something. Go ahead, Malcolm. 
No, but they, well, they've just left, but they were talking about, <laughs> they were listening to our, for some of our conversation, but they did make the point that uh, they were actually on the subject of Black Lives Matter. They said that uh, color was not the important thing to them. I think in essence was where they were coming from. Right, got, got it. Um, Paul, I think most people um, would, would be pretty horrified that Donald Trump had just paid $750 in tax. That's well, why you, they said it. Yeah, again, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a spin by, the, by certain media outlets. The $750 in tax that he supposedly paid was actually a filing fee. Um, so in, in our IRS tax system, there's, there's actually fees that, uh, that you have to pay uh, in certain certain aspects of uh, of your businesses, and so um, again, we really don't know what he's actually paid because they haven't been sent out. But um, they they pick out one thing where they say, "Well, he paid a seven hundred fifty dollar filing fee, and that's how much tax he's paid." Where I, I think in the first presidential debate, or was it an earlier interview? He he said it was a good thing. It was um you know paying little taxes was 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 a, was a good thing. Well, I agree. Yeah, but I think people need to also realize uh, that, I mean, if the tax code allows it, then what has he done wrong? Correct. I mean, yeah. in, in the United States, the way we have set up our tax code, um, we actually uh, try to incentivize uh, business because business mm -hmm. employs people and actually ultimately pays the majority of taxes. Um, I, guess the, I guess the question is, he's either a highly successful businessman making a lot of profit, in which case um, he should be paying a lot of taxes, or he's not a highly successful businessman, and that explains why he doesn't have to pay any personal income tax. It just really depends on all the array of businesses that he has. If you conglomerate all those together and he has major, major wins over here and he has losses over there, uh, you try to maximize your losses and minimize your wins um, as far as the tax code is concerned. <laughs> So uh, it's a game that that is played uh, by every single business in this country. And yet I can tell you as one of them, we pay a heck of a lot of taxes. OK, let's bring in Claudia Baker and then Graham Fry off the back of each other. So Claudia first, let's be um, prompt with the questions if we can. So Claudia, go ahead. Claudia, just do you agree with the media suggestion? Oh, go on. OK, do you agree with the media suggestion? that Biden last night in the debate realized himself that he had made a mistake when he said that he would move away from oil. Greg. Well, <laughs> yeah, because if he, I think he really taught, what he did is he revealed uh, exactly what his intentions are, what the intentions of his party is. And I think when he really thought about uh, just exactly as President Trump pointed out that, uh, uh, that it's a huge, huge mistake and uh, uh, yeah, just like we all have when we say something dumb, uh, we we uh, we agree that it was a mistake. Yeah. Okay. Graham Fry. Let's bring bring in Graham Fry. Graham. I'm a great. I, I'm actually here with Philip Godfrey as well, who who okay. uh, <laughs> you remember from lots of our tours. So, yeah, sort of Philip here, actually. Uh, hello, uh, all of you, and thank you to the panel for a very interesting presentation. Um. What interests me over the course of this political tour, uh, presidential campaign, has been the, the, the oft-repeated uh, thought that a lot of voters, uh, particularly Trump supporters, are not being honest about their vote. And some comfort has been taken, I think, by Republicans that that'll skew things a bit in their favour in the outcome. But stepping back and being non-partisan for a moment, does the panel feel that that's actually helping American politics and democracy, that they can actually um, talk about a large number of people are not prepared to say they vote for Donald Trump because they feel stigmatized by that? I mean, how good is that for the body politic? I'm not making a, I'm not making a partisan point here, just saying for the your country, and I'm speaking to you from the Cotswolds in England, for your country, how do you feel about that? I well, I would just say quickly, and I don't want to monopolize the time here from my, my colleagues, but uh, no, I, I worry about that a great deal. The, uh, the degree of polarization that we have uh, in this country that's leading to people not wanting to share 
uh, you know, share their thoughts. Uh, you know, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to wear the Trump hat. I mean, you, I mean, you routinely hear, you know, if you have a sticker on your car, the car is uh, vandalized, uh, people knocking hats off of people's heads. You have people going out to dinner and, and uh, they're being, uh, you know, harassed and, and whatnot. Uh, I mean, I say very openly, we, uh, we as a country cannot long survive with this degree of polarization, particularly with the, the, the level of bitterness that it has. Um, you know, it used to be, like I say, I'm 68 years old. I mean, I remember, you know, we had the different parties. We, they disagreed. We had elections. You won, you lost, and then you kind of went back to living life. Uh, our, arm, you know, our Armed Services Committee and in, 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 uh, in Congress, uh, the Intel Committees, uh, they were always known to be the least partisan of the committees because that we we all see in the past coalesced more around uh, uh, and I would say contrary to what Joe Biden said not the idea that was America the idea that is America and we coalesced ultimately around the idea uh, of what it means to be an American. Uh, sadly, that is being lost. I mean, I think that's even part of uh, you know this this particular election cycle. It's almost a battle over uh, really you know. What is our what is the concept of the body politic of of America? Uh, what is important about and and how do we define ourselves as Americans? And so, I, I Philip, I think it was. I'm not seeing the name there, but but I I, I worry about that a, a great great deal. Unless we get ourselves uh, back to the ability to listen to one another, uh, to to have some kind of a baseline of facts that we can agree on about which we can reason uh, rather than just pure narrative. And it's either you conform to the narrative or you don't. And if you don't, I mean, Republicans, uh, you know, it's kind of the, the cliche and the stereotype, but it's like, you know, you say, hey, I'm a Republican. Oh, well, then you're a racist, a bigot and a homophobe, uh, which is which is simply not <laughs> true. Uh, but but I mean, if that's the kind of the the opener of the conversation, you don't get very far. I would leave it to my others to. Well, that's Maybe add some. Um, I wanted to add something because um, I, I know you were saying a bigot, but I mean, even as of today, someone uh, in someone who's known me from childhood sent me a video basically calling all black people who support President Trump coons. So that's that that um, sellouts different names that, you know, are attributed to me um, based on the hypocrisy. Um, of our country, knowing that if in 2010, I was wearing a uh, President Obama hat, I would have been celebrated. Mm -hmm. And that's a sad commentary that based on, I mean, I'm the same person with the same values. Yeah. And when I vote those values, I am being, uh, lambasted for doing such. So did you vote for Obama um, before? I was trying to track that, I didn't get that. As a, as a, I'm so thankful to be an American. As an American, it broke my heart that I could not vote for the first black president because he did not hold my values. Mm. And so, no, I did not vote for him. Mm. Yeah, okay. I, my wife threw out the term there, coon, that you may or may not be familiar with. That that was kind of a derogatory racist term that uh, whites used toward black people, you know, back in the day, which is kind of ironic. So now you have black people who have taken on the language of the oppressor in order to talk about people who are no longer being oppressed by the oppressor. Okay. I want to get in um, Neil Fleming's question. Neil is famous for asking questions, but his microphone usually doesn't work. So Neil, let's try it this time. This is a running gag of this show. Can Neil. you hear me today? Yes, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Neil. In, in for, President Trump's been in power for four years. Can you quantify how much he has actually drained the swamp? Uh, and and Net and Keith, very quick. Let's just rattle through it. Net and Keith, how much did he drain the the swamp, and then it's gone to Greg and Paul very quickly. Well, he may not have made, in my opinion, he may not have made a lot of progress in draining it, but he's definitely exposed yes. a, a ton of it. Yes, yes, he's yeah, he's definitely taken the covers off of the swamp animals that we have to deal with. Okay, Greg, what does that mean? Uh, I, th I think it means uh, it just highlights how entrenched the uh, the bureaucracy is. 
uh, and it is a very difficult animal to to fight. I mean, you have you know presidents come and go. Uh, I mean, military leaders come and go, but that but that the bureaucracy uh, and the people that run that the kind of the lifelong people they remain. It is extremely extremely difficult. But um, uh, Paul, as far as I'm aware, there's no legislation banning lobbyists. And if you talk about swamp, it's the lobbying and the money that goes with it that's really counted as a swamp. They haven't stopped. Well, I would disagree with that sentiment to some degree in that um, a lot of people use the term lobbyist as a very derogatory wow. term. Um, I actually served as a lobbyist for, uh, for the previous company I was in, and we actually bring a tremendous amount of value to the discussion because you have to put yourself in the position of a legislator who is, in this case in Virginia, it, there, there is a 45 or 60 day session that they have over 3,000 bills that they have to do uh, they have to deal with. They have to fully understand all of the consequences of what that bill will do. And so they heavily, heavily depend on, and quite frankly, uh, they, they rely on uh, lobbyists to come in and give them the skinny of what is really going on with that bill. Yeah. And I will tell you that in the real world of lobbying, um, if you lie or you uh, somehow misrepresent uh, the position It'll be the last time that you go into a legislator's office okay. um, to uh, to actually lobby for something. Paul, your sound is your microphone's a bit faint. I don't know. I'm not too sure what's going on there. We've got one. I want to ask one last question um, of all of you. Um, can you just all give us a prediction, perhaps an electoral college prediction? What do you think the outcome is going to be of the election? Let's start with you, Greg. What do you think it's going to be? Uh, my prediction is that it will be a significant uh, electoral college victory, and if we can uh, hold mm -hmm. down hold down the fraud, I think uh, we even have prospects for a uh, a popular vote victory as well. Okay, and um, uh, Paul, I agree with Greg. I think um, based on what I'm seeing and hearing, I really do believe that Trump is going to pull this out, um, and he's going to have a significant electoral college victory. Okay, and Keith and Annette. I mean, I believe that he's going to win, but I wasn't given the gift of prophecy, so I can't make a prediction. <laughs> very good. I think, um, and, uh, Jerry, and the same. one last question. Sorry, Jerry, do you want to go ahead very briefly? Jerry? Can you hear Jerry. me now? Yeah, go on, Jerry. Yeah. Yeah, I wondered what uh, everyone thought if the prospect was that Trump lost what his future, legal future, would be. I think it's a whole can of worms, that one. I don't think we can answer that one. Yeah. <laughs> let's well, let's Andrew, save please. that for a moment, Jerry. Uh, I think what we're going to do, because it's now we've gone well past the hour, it's gone 10 minutes past the hour, and I think we're going to let our guests go. It's been a real privilege. Um, Malcolm Brown is going to stay with us. Dave Swenson, Professor David Swenson, is still on the line. So we're going to hold, if everyone can hold on for afterwards, we're going to have our discussion with Malcolm and Dave here so we can just talk about things in a bit more bit more detail. My thanks very much to Gregory Schumacher, um, also to Keith and to Annette McCulloch for their participation, uh, and also to Paul Lawrence. Um, it's been a really, really insightful discussion. Very, very useful for us to hear some uh, a good range of Republican views. And I think you've all got slightly different perspectives, which is really, really helpful to us. So thank you both very, all of you very much indeed. So Nicholas, one last thing, all of you across the pond, you're welcome to come visit us here in Virginia at any time. So uh, Absolutely. you be careful about that because we generally do. <laughs> we do. We'd love, we love to have you. <laughs> very good. Blessings to you. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Um, just to look ahead to um, the, the next week, um, we are going to be in North Carolina. Uh, we're going to be in Chapel Hill, which is near the Research Triangle and also in the area of the universities around there. So high in you know, a high degree of education there, Democrat leaning, another significant tranche of the electorate. It was representative of another significant tranche of the electorate there. That's on Thursday at 9 p.m. GMT. The clocks will have changed by next week. So the hours are going to be different for everyone around the world for that. And after that, we'll be in Wilkes County, which is far more rural, even more rural than Fauquier County. Um, it's actually where moonshine and um, prohibition has, a, has some great roots there. Uh, and along with it, NASCAR. 
So um, I'm hoping that we can get Malcolm down to the Wilkesboro um, circuit, which is one of the first NASCAR circuits, in, if not the first NASCAR circuit uh, in the States. So I'm very much looking forward to the broadcast from Wilkes County there. Thank you all very much again for your participation. It's been a really, really good show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do stay on the line, everybody else. Um, I just want to get Malcolm to ch chip in to start with. Um, Malcolm, I, I thought that was really interesting. We, I think we saw a cross-section of, of views there. And obviously that split in the Republican Party between the libertarian side, you've got somebody who supported um, gay marriage, who officiates at a gay marriage session, and then the party, the, the, there's a, a, a primary and he's removed. So we saw that split there. I mean, I think it's fair to say that Gregory is on one side and then Keith Renette were on another side. Yeah, and I think Greg would probably say or acknowledge, I mean, he, he alluded to the polls, but the polls in that particular race have Cameron Webb, who is the Democrat, uh, slightly ahead. Uh, so I think he would probably, to finish his thought, you know, it's dangerous, but, you know, I think what he was saying was that actually in this instance, not only he did he support Riggleman, who was, you know, certainly by European standards, deeply conservative, um, that, that it was a mistake, and he might even say it was tactically a mistake, because now the Democrats in, in with a shout in a, in a place that was held by a, a very conservative Republican already. Um, and so Cameron Webb, he's a, a young doctor. He served in the Obama administration. He's African-American. Um, he's, he's out of Charlottesville, um, which is part of this weirdly shaped district that I was telling you about. There's a big African-American vote around there. Uh, and in some of the more urban centers of this district, you know, he's clearly harvesting votes. So um, there's a chance that the, the choice of the biblical conservative, which was what happened in the rather odd um, convention process that Greg was trying to describe, that basically in COVID era involved a whole lot of Republican activists driving down to, I think, Fredericksburg, which is a couple of hours from here, or an hour to two hours from here, uh, and casting their votes. They chose this biblical conservative, and that may, in fact, have have backfired uh, on them uh, in the general elections uh, as things currently stand, although it's, it is pretty close in fairness. I, and I think the other thing that came through to me is that all our panelists were amazingly consistent in their views. There was no mention of COVID. There didn't seem to be any sort of, um, apart from that debate within the party about those two candidates in that congressional district, that there seemed to be a, sort of a, a united front. If we go back to Wisconsin, we had two, two um, senior people, the head of the Wisconsin GOP and the strategist in the, in the, in the GOP, political strategist of the GOP, basically saying um, made major mistakes have been made and they thought they're going to lose the state. But we didn't see any of that in Fakir County, did we? Well, maybe my expectations are different. I was actually surprised by how critical they were of, of Trump. You know, I mean, you do hear it privately that people wish he would stop tweeting, but they were pretty open about their concerns and his limitations of character. I was also a bit surprised that when asked, you know, what his greatest accomplishment was, that nobody mentioned the Supreme Court, which if you're a religiously motivated conservative in this country, the Supreme Court is an undoubted win. I mean, Democrats, you couldn't argue that point at all. Mm. I mean, he, especially if Amy Comey Barrett, um, as expected next week gets confirmed as a supreme court justice that is going to change the complexion the political complexion of the supreme court for generations to come she is in judicial terms a young woman uh, and uh, uh president trump has made uh, i think i'm right three uh supreme court uh picks so that really has been uh, uh, something that goes beyond just the next election and in fact you occasionally hear conservatives say look We'd happily, well, not happily, but, you know, we could lose this election and we would still have had a major victory in, in, in the Supreme Court. And also not just the Supreme Court, but also in uh, federal courts around the country, which um, with the assistance of uh, the U.S. Senate, he has pumped conservatives into the federal judiciary at uh, an almost unprecedented speed. And uh, that will also have a lasting impact. In fact, to the point where there are concerns, and this is why Joe Biden's under so much pressure about how he might respond to that, there are concerns that, you know, the, the complexion of the ju federal judiciary and the Supreme Court could be fundamentally out of whack the with the bulk of the population and the Dems are having to confront, well, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I, I want to stand back for a second because I wanted to really talk about the significance of Fakir County 
electorally across the map. And I want to turn to you, Dave. And I was looking back at some of the reports by from on Dante Cini's um, reports on, on these areas. And he talks about the gradual erosion of the Republican vote in these areas. Um, I know that um, the reporter from the Fakir Times is saying that you know that the the Democratic turnout has been consistent, but you might suspect that the, the Democrats might have a uh, an increased turnout there. That the, our panelists suggested um, that there was a very united front there. Um, but even this kind of county, this more rural area, is seeing uh, an increase in some Democratic turnout. Is is that does that seem right to you, Dave? Oh, sure it does. This place stands out a little bit differently from, I think, a lot of exurban places that were described. It's, it's, it's growing at a relatively good pace. It, it has a high standard of living, high quality of life. The fact, as I was looking at the statistics and listening to the discussion, the fact that they're able to maintain the GOP margin thus far is, is actually surprising. They're not of some of the other kinds of exurbs either. Well, there's two different types. One is those that tend to be really more rural that they're losing people, especially young college educated people to the more central cities or some of the more affluent um, suburbs. And those areas are becoming GOP more by default um, for a period of time. This looks to be a place that you would expect to be being for lack of a better word, um, slowly infiltrated by, by much more liberal leaning a population. So I, if I were to ask a question of these folks, I am just absolutely fascinated how in this area of relative affluence yet so significantly affected by the DC culture across the board, how have they maintained this GOP um, juggernaut of basically close to two thirds over the last several uh, cycles. And I would have asked too, how threatened do they feel about mm -hmm. that in the future? Um, but this, you know, when you, I wanna go back to what you were saying about Dante, the, the, the excerpts are important. What we heard tonight was exactly what Trump needs to hear from his base. And, and this is what reinforces the Trump's base. This, this is what reinforces certain subsets of geography and their confidence in, in, in this candidate. And I thought this was just an excellent representation of how his base um, views both the president and how unified they are on a subset of issues that matters to them. Yeah, I thought that was absolutely fascinating too. But Malcolm, you have seen that sense of fear even with yard signs, I think, with um, uh, you, were, you were telling me earlier about um, Fokia not becoming, what were you saying? Yeah, they don't want it to be another Fairfax, basically, and they're quite protective of that. And now, obviously, you can't exclude people from moving in. What I think is going to be really interesting, uh, to Dave's point, is the, the effect that, you know, COVID is having. I've a friend of mine a, is a realtor around here and he's getting unprecedented amounts of inquiries and purchases from people who are trying to move out of the city. Now, some of those are weekend homes. You're close enough to DC to have a weekend home. It's pretty convenient. Uh, you know, you can be from Warrington, you can be in D center DC in about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, so you can definitely weekly commute easily. Um, you know, if you've got the stomach for it, you could daily commute. So it'd be interesting to see the extent to which COVID drives that and whether that brings with it different social social values. But if you go back through the years, the, in the presidential vote, it has been un amazingly consistent at around the 60% mark. I mean, going back, I went back as far as George W. Bush and he got just over 60%, I think. But you could go back further, I'm sure, and, and see pretty similar results. So it has, it may be an outlier in that sense. Yeah, I, I don't want to over describe though, the short term COVID responses and, and longer term uh, perspectives. We're, I think, I think we're, we're going to get a, a rebound of people coming back into central cities um, after the coast is clear on COVID and that this is a temporary phenomenon. But, but nonetheless, this feels like a place that is really on the cusp of conversion of one form or another. And it'd be interesting to watch it over the next two cycles. Yeah, we've got to look at the figures after election day just to see how 
what's happened in Fakir County would be absolutely fascinating. Let's get some comments, or if you want to put a question to Dave or to Malcolm, um, please do go ahead. So I've got we've got your questions obviously from the from the session now. If you want to put in some more questions, please do. I'm going to pick on Neil. It's a delight to be able to hear your voice. So I want to hear it again. Go ahead, Neil. <laughs> Uh, hi, hi, Nicholas. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'm think I'm thinking obviously. Um, uh, hang on, start a video. We're good. We're good. Um, uh, that's it. It's not going to make any difference for next Tuesday week's presidential election this time around. But um, I think. Akio is one of those places, to me, it sounds as though it'll be interesting to see how it fares um, with the redistribution of boundaries that's likely to come up before the next midterms. And I can't recall, what's, what's the political um, leadership in the state of Virginia at the moment? Is that a Democrat or uh, Republican? It's or actually fairly, fairly recently Democrat. And actually the whole redistricting issue is very live at the moment Neil because there is yeah. a there's a referendum attached there is a, a, a vote as part of your ballot um, right now in Virginia as to whether or not you would agree with the creation of a kind of a it's a bit of a, a hybrid but uh, so at the moment the objection is from reformers that uh, politicians essentially choose the boundaries of their districts. And obviously that's why you end up with these weird gerrymandered districts as they desperately try to include one population and exclude another to their yep. political advantage. Um, so the, the, the question before Virginia voters in this vote right now is whether or not you would go ahead with a, a commission which is sort of half made up of politicians and half made up of citizens, but those citizens also, I think, chosen by politicians. So it's a bit of a hybrid. It's not a perfect solution as far as reformers would, would say, but you know, if you're a glass half full kind of guy, you would say, well, it might be better than the, the status quo. Democrats were previously quite supportive of reform. Now that they've got their hands on the levers of power in Richmond, the state capital, they've gone a little lukewarm on this, uh, this particular referendum point. And uh, they are, I think, and statewide not supporting this particular form of reform. So that's where we are right now, but it's a live issue right across the country. And, and many other states choosing similar commissions as well. And, and I think those of you who are in Ohio um, with us on pre two previous election tours can possibly remember one lobbyist describing this riding that he created across the north of the uh, state, which was a hundred miles long and managed to uh, get in all the uh, suburbs and skirt around the African Ameri American areas. So um, ob obviously, and that, and that sort of pushes the parties on both sides. They only have to appeal to their own base. So they don't have any interest in, in going to the sort of center ground. So it does affect American politics um, enormously. I think it makes it more extreme. Um, so it's a bit, it's a very, very live issue in terms of how those districts are, are shaped. Um, let's get some some more thoughts before we before we wrap up. Graham Fry um, is still there, I hope. Go ahead, Graham. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's it's his interloper, Philip. <laughs> it's, <laughs> sorry. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit like Breakback Mountain in the Cotswolds here. <laughs> uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, my question for Dave and for Malcolm um, is, and for yourself, Nicholas, is did Biden get away with it? in the debate last night. We, we went, as you know, to Iowa. We watched him, uh, Biden that is, and he was uh, underwhelming. And we've been waiting for the last six months to see him fall over and be exposed. Uh, Trump gave him more time in the discussion yesterday. He didn't override him. Uh, did he do himself any favors or is it net neutral and he's got away with it, that's Biden, has got away with this interaction at the presidential debate. David? Oh, well, my, my first response is that all of our expectations apparently have either been lowered or shifted into a very, very smaller area. And Biden seems to be fitting the bill. Um, you can argue with regard to Trump that, that the expectations are really, really low for a, a lot of people. But in the case of Biden, it, it does seem like that may be the case. 
but whether he got away with anything, I don't know if, if, if all that means is that he's been consistently Biden all the way through and whether he was underwhelming four months, six, seven, eight months ago, um, he's perhaps equally as underwhelming right now. And we seem to be, we as in the, the, the collective, we seem to be um, accepting that. Yeah, I think the, the, the consensus seemed to have been, and it, I, I sort of endorse it, I guess, that, I mean, unless he fell off his chair or forgot where he was or some other cataclysmic uh, screw up, um, he was probably okay. And um, he met that low, low, low hurdle, I think. Um, and for Trump, it was probably an okay night, but Trump needed a big win um, because if the polls, I mean, this has been a remarkab remarkably static race. I mean, all the things that have happened in the course of this year, the numbers haven't changed a huge amount. Trump did dip um, after the first debate, which was perceived to have been a, a pr pretty, even by his supporters, candidly, was pretty bad for him. But I mean, within narrow margins, this race really hasn't changed a lot. And it's hard to see anything in that debate last night that would have changed it. Although, you know, Trump did okay. And if you were inclined to him, you were probably reassured that he could occasionally put in a performance where he looked somewhat presidential. Um, the two things that strike me is the slight paranoia of um, Democrats or people who believe who want Biden to win and think, could the polls be wrong again? And we've obviously explored that, particularly when earlier this week we did a session in, in, in Florida with a, a pollster who clearly said he thought that um, the Republicans did have the lead in the swing states and, and his polls were geared towards engaging with Trump supporters, which he thought were undercounted in most polls. Uh, and then on the sort of flip side of that coin is that from the site this evening's show, it, it just seemed to me that um, it, all the people we spoke to clearly believed that Trump was going to win, or um, am, I, am I mistaken? Dave. Go ahead, Dave. I, uh, yeah, I'm there now. Um, no, the, the consistency of their convictions was, I thought, uh, really, really um, interesting. They did not hesitate. They, they basically say they believe. And here's what I heard. I, there was a lot, especially with Gregory, I heard a lot of, of bracketing of, of sets of boundaries where this is the knowledge that we're um, accepting and this is the knowledge that we're not accepting. And the knowledge that we're accepting is telling us that we have a good, strong, desirable candidate and that candidate is performing well and, and we're happy about that. And their only place to go with that kind of bracketing is that we're going to have a positive outcome. Yeah. And I would say also, if you're wandering around, you know, you see around this part of the world, you see a lot of Trump signage and, you know, they go on these com uh, Trump caravans. They just drove one all the way down where everyone gets in a car and there's the whole, there's a convoy of cars with Trump flags. And if you were inhabiting that world all the time, I think it's probably easier to imagine that actually the fervency of the support is still definitely there. The people who support him really support him. They're not lukewarm about him for the most part. Mm. Um, and, you know, Biden supporters aren't typically getting in, you know, 200 car caravans and driving to the North Carolina border, even though they passionately want Donald Trump to to leave office so if you if you're in in trump world and you're all in it's probably easier to imagine you look at next year on either side and there are people shoulder to shoulder with you just as passionate as you are so it's you know just psychologically you probably do feel good about the situation even if that's only a, a very small subset of what's going on in the country mm. as, uh, as a as a whole i do want to get a few more thoughts from people before we wrap up i can see caroline sumnall's name in front front of me caroline have you got any thoughts there Yes, I loved the liberal elite point um, earlier. I thought that's um, spot on. Uh, what is the liberal elite point? Um, just that that's put um, uh, Trump, uh, basically it's just frustrating Trump supporters um, because people are looking down on them and so forth. Well, I don't really get that one because I can't see how if you've got, let's say take um, uh, the amount of people voted for Hillary Clinton, are they all part of the liberal elite? all of them but i think there's a good fraction of them that are and i i i, I honestly i just think there's this patch of, it's very similar to the brexit 
I think it's so dismissive of people who have got genuine interests in politics, who want to see some kind of change or genuine kind of belief. It's such an easy way, way to say that they're part of the liberal elite. OK, so I think it's a bit like the Brexit situation where everyone in London went, oh, my goodness, that's really shocking that everybody else feels a different way than we do. I, I thought it was a really good point about the patronising nature of, um, uh, well, what they call the liberal elite. But yeah, I thought it was a great point. OK, great. I've got Lynn Maddox um, name in front of me. Lynn, a final thought from you and then we'll wrap up after that. Lynn. Sorry, Nicholas, mine's a bit left field. Um, I don't know whether the religious base of Trump is evangelical or Catholic, like the Supreme Court is primarily Catholic. Um, will people even notice that Pope Francis came out the other day and implied that same-sex marriage was okay? I, I wonder if that'll have any play at all. I, I, I have seen that on, on the, you know, being covered in the US press. I'm, I'm not too sure. I think there's just so much noise on at the moment. I don't think it's going to have much, much resonance there. Is that a fair thing to say, Malcolm? Yeah, it's, I mean, so evangelicals typically are Protestant, um, I think, uh, for the most part here, which isn't to say that Catholics aren't, you know, moved by their religious beliefs to uh, behave politically. But, um, you know, typically when you're referring to evangelicals here, they tend to be um, Protestant groupings. And we'll find out more of that in North Carolina. Uh, but it has penetrated the consciousness here, the, the Pope's position. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't see it being a huge electoral factor, but there's been some reporting on it. OK, Malcolm, just um, tell us a bit more about our next stop, which is Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill, huge college town, University of North Carolina is based there. Um, it's a weird time to be there because they were, they brought all their students back. Um, so in, they were, they attempted to be in person, uh, but then after certainly a matter of days decided after an outbreak of uh, several outbreaks of COVID that that wasn't going to work. And so they basically said that they wouldn't be having in-person classes anymore. And most students were sent home again. So that's making it an unusual time because it's typically a place where Democrats especially expect to harvest larger numbers of student votes. It's not clear to me what happens to those student votes. Obviously students can also vote at home or they can request a mail-in ballot, but given that the youth population typically isn't as good at turning out. And when you've, if you add the added hurdles of you know, organizing postal ballots and going to the post office and all the stuff that you have to do you know that may drive down turnout there you know does that have an impact and that's particularly important in North Carolina where the race is really very tight that is one of the real swing states right now yeah and there are so many other similar university towns across the states and that's again why we've chosen that particular spot Listen, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. It's been a really, really good discussion. Thank you again to Dave Swenson and also to Malcolm Brown for all their time. We will see you again next Thursday, and that's at 9 p.m. GMT, 9 p.m. GMT, and the, ch the times will be different in different parts of the world because of the clock change. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Bye for now.